From the great score that Marvin Hamlish did for Woody Allen's Bananas, one of the early so-called funny films of Woody Allen. But, of course, the arc of his career has been remarkable from those straightforward comedies through drama with interiors and ones that combine the two. You have movies that have had an impact on the culture like Annie Hall and others that have simply captured an era in incredibly important ways. And now a documentary on Woody Allen in two parts on people. PBS debuting this Sunday night provides unprecedented access to Woody Allen. He goes back to his Brooklyn neighborhood. You see him on the set, and he talks about the arc of his career and his own sense of of what his most important artistic influences are. He also reveals in this scene from the interview that he did with documentarian Robert Whitey about a formative experience and a rather frightening one involving the nanny that his mother hired for him as a kid. My mother used to leave me with these maids all the time because she was working. And uh, I remember one of them when I was a kid, uh, and I was in my crib at the time, uh, explaining to me that if she wanted to, she could kill me, that she could smother me, and she demonstrated she could wrap me in a blanket completely, cutting off all my air, and smother me, and then just dump me in the garbage outside. It was just, but she did do it, and I couldn't breathe for a few seconds, and then she let me out. And, you know, one wonders how close I came. So if that uh, nanny were just like 10% crazier, that could have been... Uh, sure, sure, huh. could have been, uh, that would have been... No, the, the world would be poorer, uh, a number of great one-liners. Spectacular, my grandfather on his deathbed sold me this watch. Woody Allen, that from the documentary that is part of American Masters. It debuts this Sunday night, 9 o'clock. It's three and a half hours total. Sunday night, it's 9 to 11 on PBS SoCal KOCE and national PBS stations. And the conclusion on Monday night, the final 90 minutes also on those PBS stations. Joining me is the director of the documentary, Robert Whitey. He's also known as the director and executive producer of Larry David's Curb Your Enthusiasm. And he's done a number of documentaries on fascinating film figures. Bob, good to have you back with us on Air Talk. Thanks, Larry. It's been a while. So how did you get this unprecedented access? I, I was amazed with all the, the interview time that you had with him. Well, when I want to, I can write a heck of a letter. And um, that's what I did in October of 2008. I wrote him. Now, I had gone to him a couple of times before over the last 20 years or so, and he'd always politely declined. But this time I was determined to get him to say yes, and I just made the case for the film, and I basically said, it's time. And the other point I made was, I'm the guy to do this. And um, what can I say? He caved. So how do, what? How did you make that case about your being the guy to Because there's so many people who would have died to have the access you did. Um, what did you say to him about your ability to capture who he was? Well, you know, I, I knew him a little bit over the years because uh, years ago I worked for Rollins and Joffe, who were his longtime producers. But it was just a very minor acquaintance. But more importantly, he knew my work because we share a lot of the same cultural heroes, the Marx Brothers and W.C. Fields and Mort Saul. And these were all subjects of my past documentaries. In fact, he appeared as a talking head in my Marx Brothers film, which was the first one. So I think it was maybe primarily that, that he knew my work. He knew, you know, that I could pull off a decent documentary. It wouldn't be a hatchet job. And, um, you know, it'd be a professional effort. There's so many things I enjoyed in it, but it, including the early clips from television shows and and uh, and the stand-up appearances. But him going back to his Brooklyn childhood, the site of the neighborhood movie theater that he went to that I think was now a dental clinic or something like that, and, and, and these locations that were so formative. And we've seen, of course, in movies like Annie Hall about what that boyhood was like. So it was great to see what it looks like today, as well as the archival photos you included. Yeah, somebody mentioned that the trip to Brooklyn reminded uh, them of uh, Annie Hall when he and Tony Roberts and Diane Keaton go back to the old neighborhood. But what was interesting about that, I mean, the the biggest hurdle I had with him, you know, there, there were no control issues or, you know, final cut issues or anything like that. The biggest hurdle I had with him was the self-deprecating streak 
whenever I would pitch something like, I'd say, why don't we go back to your old neighborhood and look around? His first reaction was always, eh, I don't know, do you really think anyone's going to be interested in that? I mean, who cares where I grew up or where I went to school or where I played stickball in the street? And then he'd always say, I'll do it if you want, but I, I can't imagine anything interesting is going to come of it. And that's the same thing he said when I asked him about filming him on the set in London of, of his picture a couple of years ago. And, of course, it's fascinating. What I told him was, look, if they're interested enough to watch the film, they'll be interested in this. If, if not, then they won't be watching anyway. Well, it's not as though this, these references aren't in his films. This is a filmmaker for whom his life experiences are prime fodder for what he writes about in the movie. So if anybody's going to be interested in a director's background, it would be someone like Woody Allen. Also, Martin Scorsese was in your film, another one who... Those boyhood experiences are, are seminal in what he does. Well, that's why I wanted to do it, aside from just the, the, the kick of seeing him, uh, uh, you know, walking around Flatbush, was, you know, this is really a film about his work. And I cover his biography, certainly, but uh, to the extent that it informs his work. And I thought that going back and seeing his childhood haunts uh, you know, would somehow provide some sort of key to, to to his work. I also hadn't seen, Bob, much from the actors who'd worked with him talking about his working process. And I'd always wondered why that is, why they seemed so reluctant to get into the details of what a Woody Allen movie set is like. But here you have so many of the people over the years that have worked with him who really got into that and opened up. Why do, does it seem like they're protective of him or reluctant, but here we're really willing to, to tell what it was like? Well, I, I think they respect the fact that he's a very private guy. And, you know, he's not he's not standoffish and he's not antisocial. He's just shy and he's a little reticent. And I think people who work with him respect that. And, you know, once I got his authorization to do the film, I could go to a Sean Penn or a Mira Sorvino or Mariel Hemingway and say, you know, Woody's on board. And as soon as they knew that, they were actually quite eager to participate. What is interesting about his process with the actors is everybody says this, including Woody, is that he's sort of a minimalist director. He always says that, you know, he he barely talks to his actors or he'll talk to them if he has to. In other words, if they have a question. Otherwise, Woody's, again, very modest summation is that if you hire great actors, and as he says in the documentary, if you just shut up and get out of the way and let them do what they do, they'll give you the great performance that they're known for. Now, the week I was tailing him in London, he was working with Antonio Banderas and, and Naomi Watts and uh, Josh Brolin, all first-rate actors. But they happened to be actors who wanted a little feedback from him. So he's there for it. So I actually it was a good week to be there because I've got some rare footage of Woody actually – you know, working pretty closely with his actors. One of the things I've always wondered, I'm a huge fan of Ellen's, but one of the things that's given me a bit of pause is that so often the leading women in his films have the same speaking cadence. And I always wonder, well, how, if he's not a very hands-on director directing them that way, how does it sound like they're all kind of imitating this vocal pattern from the previous leading lady of his films? You know, it's funny. My, my grandfather had a thick Yiddish accent, and uh, my brother and I would sometimes tease him by speaking to him in an, with a Yiddish accent, and we could never tell if he could actually tell we were doing that or not. So I'm not certain that, that Woody actually hears that sometimes the actors are picking up on his cadence. He, he certainly doesn't direct them to do so. I think to the extent that you hear that sometimes, I think people who read a Woody Allen script just know his rhythms in their head because they've seen all of his movies, and maybe they consciously or unconsciously, more more likely, just pick up on that cadence. And he doesn't encourage it, and he doesn't uh, um, direct them to do so. I think sometimes people have been accused of that unfairly. Uh, people said that about John Cusack in Bullets Over Broadway, and I thought Cusack very much was using his own voice and his own rhythms. But there there have been actors who've picked up on that a little well, bit. Well, particularly the women is where I, I've noticed it. We're talking